Well, I salute each and every one of you with the awesome and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. Shall they be multiplied unto you this evening as we continue in a series on the book of Revelation. And tonight we begin a new chapter, chapter 11 of the book of Revelation. Just as a quick minor recap. Uh, we got into chapter 6 on the last, uh, correction, uh, chapter 10 on the last Bible study. Uh, and chapter 10 covered a gap of a period of time between the 6th and the 7th angel or messenger uh, giving the trumpet sound or the warning or the prophetic voice in the earth realm as we're understanding for the continuation of what is going on in the book of Revelation. Amen. As we understand and I pray for those who have been with me at the beginning of this series, even up until now, uh, we understand that Revelation is not about a lot of doom and gloom, but it's about power and boom. Revelation is is not about uh, uh, some unknown symbolism per se, more so than it is about the revelation or the revealing or the unveiling of who Jesus Christ is. Amen. The Yahshua King, Christ himself. Um, I will say, and I, and I echo this, even though there are many other major theologians that have written on the book of Revelation uh, for years past and maybe for years to come, I am not dismissing any of their uh, theological perceptions, uh, but God has given me a little bit of a different one, more of a more prophetic view that hopefully will bless you and expand your understanding of the scriptures. Amen. So I don't want anybody to, to get it twisted or, or contorted that, well, uh, Apostle Elliot taught it this way and then that way is incorrect or so forth. Amen. Uh, uh, so I, I, I want you to keep everything open, but once again, this is more from a spiritual a prophetic understanding of the scripture. Amen. Uh, so as I was saying in chapter 10, we began to understand uh, in regards to the angel or the messenger that had the book. And we began to get into the details of the book as the scripture tells us that uh, the messenger told John to take the book and John took the book and it was said it would be sweet in his mouth, but it would be bitter in his stomach. And as, as we got a revelation, stomach is not just about stomach where we digest food, but in the translation out of the Greek, the word stomach means womb. So it means, it means place where seed goes. Uh, you know, we began to understand spiritually from that context that uh, uh, pregnancy is not limited to the biological body of just a woman. Pregnancy is also inclusive of the male gender uh, because once again, John being a male is the one who's told to eat the book and that it would be sour to his womb or, or it, would, it would be difficult. And as we understand that, we, we love to read the word for those that like the word of God. But the thing is, sometimes there's some things that are hard for us when we get it in our spirit. That's what, what, what's prophetically being symbolized by the fact of it being bitter on, on John's stomach or being bitter to our stomach. Because keep in mind this. We have to also be uh, very perceptive and understand that even as we go through the book of Revelation and we look at John, we have to also be able to step into John's shoes in a matter of, of speaking in order to see this applying to us. Because I've said this before, I'll say it again in your hearing. The word of God is nothing more than the memoirs of your own life. You think about it, uh, and I'll, I'll get to the text, but if you think about it, Ask yourself, why is it that over and over in every situation that you get into in your life, you can always go pick up the word of God and find a solution. You can always find a scripture that ties to what your situation is and it'll give you the remedy. Why is it able to give you the remedy, especially if we're believing that it was written over 2000 years ago or more, other than the fact that it's only showing you you. 
Amen. So this this gives us more depth and understanding as to why understanding the word of God is significant. It gives us the understanding as to why we have to get into this and begin to even look at revelations into the dimensions of Christ in order to make ourselves better. Because remember, we're calling ourselves to be Christ like. So how do you become Christ like unless you look in the mirror in order to see what he looks like, unless you look into the the scripture, which once again is the memoir of you to see what you are supposed to look like. Because remember, you know, some people don't think about this, but 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 they say, OK, when Adam was created, then we got erred. Uh, and, and so Christ had to take on our form. No, really, the reality of it is we took his form. We were the prototype. He was the original. Oh, somebody hear me right there. Uh, uh, this you, you got to get this in. He was the original. All right. OK, you, you, you think about it, even back in Genesis, let us make make man in our own image. And then, you know, later on, a couple of chapters down, it talks about a form from the dust of the ground. So he is the original that we were made not like, not him having to be made like us. We just in the errored form, he came to uh, 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 give us the opportunity to have our DNA restructured back to being the perfect type. That's why scriptures talk about being perfected. Amen. Ah, uh, but I'm not going to get on a long rendition with that. Now I want to get into tonight's text. So for those of you that's got the word of the Lord with you, turn with me to Revelations chapter 11. Amen. And, and let me read this text to you. And then we'll begin to, to uh, um, get into the depth of what it says. Revelations chapter 11, verse one, and I'm reading to you from the standard King James version. And it says, and there was given me, and we're talking about John, uh, there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Okay, now let's let's begin to look at this first verse as as we're still dealing with the angel or the messenger that's talked about in uh, chapter 10. The one that one foot was upon the sea and the other foot was upon the land. The same messenger that said that time should be no more. There should be no more hours in the day. There should be no more minutes or seconds. Uh, basically, the angel or the messenger had had declared that uh, it should be that we are no longer bound by time. We Time should be irrelevant. This is the messenger. So now it says, uh, uh, there was given me, John is saying, was given me a reed. Now, when we're talking about a reed right here, it comes from the Greek word kalemo, which means a pen. So John is given a pen. Uh, uh, basically to write in this pen. What's interesting is John describes it. He didn't just say I was given a reed. He said I was given a reed like unto a rod. All right. So he's saying the, the, the reed or IE the pen that he was given resembled a staff or a branch or watch this scepter. All right. So, Understand, here, here, here we got to get this because remember, Revelations is dealing with who Christ is. Revelation is dealing with the reality of the Christos, so the anointed one. Revelation is dealing with one of the triune body of God, which is Christ. So notice that we understand that and believe that he was a king, right? So in that, if John is in, still in a celestial place, in the place of the ultimate royalty that can exist. He is implying here that even something as simple as a pen in his possession gave the resemblance of the power of a scepter. It gave the resemblance of power of a king. Watch this real revelation is that this pen had kingly authority. What he's writing with has authority to make change. What he's writing with has authority to make influence on those who read what's coming forth. Because if you understand anything about kings, when they had a scepter, the scepter represented their kingly authority unto men. Just as much as a king wearing a crown, the scepter 
was was part of their authority. That is what they dubbed or made so. Like they would say, I dub thee a knight. I dub thee uh, 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 to be a prince. Understand? So, so John is articulating that he is given a reed or pen that is like a scepter. And it says, and the angel of the messenger stood saying, meaning now this, if the angel is standing, standing here is the Greek word histamai, which one, it means to stand, but in the same turn, standing is also establishing. So the messenger stands or establishes himself and says, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. All right. Still looking at this, this one verse. So he says, the angel of the messenger stands and as he stands, it says he, he says, or is saying, now, keep this in mind as well. As, as we look at the book of Revelation, the word say or saying comes from the Greek word lego. Lego means to speak. However, it's not just talking. It means speaking with articulation or speaking with illustration. Okay? Y'all watch what I'm saying. Many people, you know, when you, when you talk about seeing people that are, are, are motivational speakers, for instance, they don't just stand behind the podium and talk or lecture to you. Most of them that are passionate about what they do will walk and they will do illustrations with their hand that articulate what they're saying. So that is what's going on here with the messenger. The messenger is illustrating what he is saying. It's, it's, it's just like this. You know, a lot of people hadn't realized this. And I said this some time ago, when we first crossed the word Lego in the New Testament or especially in the book of Revelations. Why do you think uh, the toys that kids play with are called Legos? They are to make an illustration of what is coming out of the imagination of the child. All right. So you have to understand this is the same thing. When God talks about saying something, he's talking about you also illustrating what you are saying. So people can begin to visualize and grasp what's what, 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 what's coming out of your mouth. So the messenger, once again, is is illustrating to John and saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So he says, measure. Now, let, let, let's look at this because this, this should begin to, to make you wonder, okay, what is going on here? Did a messenger would tell John that he needs to measure uh, the temple? All right. For those of you that, that, that have the word still with you, I'm going to look at a couple of scriptures here. In regards to the temple. Okay. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm looking at verse 19. In 1 Corinthians 6 19. Paul who is the writer says. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Which is in you. Which ye have of God. And you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or belong to God. Okay, so Paul here articulates that the body is the temple. Now, keep this in mind, as I said before, when we got into Revelations chapter four and thereafter, the Holy Spirit gave me a revelation that thereafter everything is spiritual. We're not talking about physical. We're talking about spiritual. So you got you to make us uh, 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 have a revelation of spiritual things as to what's being articulated out of natural examples. Okay. So here in Corinthians, it says that the body is the temple. All right. I'm going to give you another scripture that implies the same thing. When you turn to the book of John. John chapter 2, verse 21. Um, and actually, let's look at verse 20. So you, uh, uh, or, or even go back to uh, 19. 
John chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple in three days. I will raise it up. Jesus is talking to the Sanhedrin uh, sometime shortly before he was to be crucified. Verse 20, then said the Jews, 40 and six years was this temple in building and will thou rear it up in three days. Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. Okay. So I'm, I'm setting a foundation here because I don't want you to get lost in the sauce as we continue, because many of you may be listening right now and you're saying, okay, he's talking about a temple. So you begin to visualize a physical temple. But what I'm trying to give you a revelation is the messenger was really talking to John about himself, i.e. let me still keep this in context for you as the believer. It's talking about you. So the scripture says, uh, 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 let, uh, he says, Measure the temple of God. Okay? Measure the temple of God. Not the temple made for God, but measure the temple of God. Of, keep this in mind as well for those that know a little bit about Greek. Of means from. So the scripture says measure the temple from God. Not the temple made from made for God, because if you think about that, once again, you're thinking about what man has made with himself to give and usher unto God versus what God has given unto man. So once again, I'm still trying to drill this into you. It says measure the temple of or from God, which your body is the temple that God gave to you. Okay. So in measuring measure, comes from the Greek word metreo, which means, i.e., to measure or to estimate. Get an idea. Uh, what, what this really is implying to you spiritually and prophetically is to estimate or see what your capacity is. Because you think about it. If you are measuring a room, then the real reason behind measuring it is you're trying to see what can fit in it or what you can do within the walls of it and what are your limits? What are your boundaries? That's why people measure. When, when they're going to build something, they, 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 they're going to build it only to a certain specification or to a certain length or, 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 or within a certain size because it's something that they have within the capacity of themselves to do. People, if you were having a house built, you would have to, the, 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 the architect as well as the builders would have to take measurements to see if it could be built within the property that you own. You can't build something too big that you can't pay for or you don't have the capacity to maintain. So the, the, the messenger tells him to measure the temple. All right. Check out your capacity in the spirit. Then it says, uh, uh, and the altar, okay? Altar in the Greek is thusistieron, which means place of sacrifice. It ain't, it ain't just a place that, 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 that some rocks are thrown together, but it, it, it's a place where there is a sacrifice to be made. Watch this. When I apply this back to myself in the spirit, within me is where the sacrifice is made. It's not about my external. It's about my internal being a sacrifice. So the messenger tells John, you need to see what your capacity is. You also need to see what your capacity is in sacrificing yourself. Paul says, uh, uh, we are living sacrifices. All right. So, so as we understand that we're living sacrifice, John is understanding out of the revelation that's being given by the messenger in measuring his capacity that he's being reminded. Not only is your spirit got some limitations in the same turn, uh, there is a, 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 a sacrifice that has to happen based on that spirit. Now, some people are listening and say, what, what, the spirit has limit? Yes, it does. All right, I'm going to bag that up. If you remember, the scripture says God gives you the gifts of the spirit in measure. Okay, that, that, that should gain somebody a V8 moment right there. The gifts that you get are according to the measure per individual. All right? What, what does this scripture says? It says measure the temple. 
So there's a, 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 a measure, there, there's a limitation as to the capacity of each and every one of our spirits as to what we have been designed for God or, or what we have expanded ourselves in order to be able to, to maintain and keep when it comes to God. Then it says, and them that worship therein. All right. Remember, worship comes from the Greek word proskenue, which means to prostrate, to bow down, uh, to change one's posture or to give reverence or to adore. So in the measuring, in seeing the capacity and seeing what one's ability is in order to sacrifice, it's also seeing one's ability to get into a posture of servitude. Because when, when I worship, understand this, even when changing posture, what happens if let, let's go back to the times of kings and queens when people came into the courtroom and they bowed down before the king and the queen? What they would do is they would get down on their knees, put their hands down in front of them, then they would bow their head. And so what happens is when they look up, they would look and ask the king or queen, what is thy bidding? What, what is thy purpose? What will you have me to do? I am in your presence, but now I'm ready to serve. It took me in a place to kill my way of thinking about self in order to put somebody else first. So now as I change my posture, I forget about what I want to do and now I want your will to be done through me. So in that this requires some measurement. How much am I willing to place myself before God and allow myself to be used for him? This is what's going on prophetically or spiritually with John as the messenger is, is giving him these instructions. Amen. So then we transition into verse two and it says, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot 40 and two months. Amen. Now let's, let's look at this verse. Amen. It says, but the court, which is without now, I understand court. When we look back in the physical sense, as we regard the old Testament and the temple, that is our foundation of a physical understanding. The court is the palace yard. It's on the outside of the temple. However, it is still within the gates of the temple's property. Okay. Understand this. It says, but the court or the palace yard, which is without understand without comes from the Greek word exothin, which means external or on the outside of the temple. He said, leave and measure it not. Okay, let's get a revelation here. As the messenger is talking to John, he's talking to John. I need you to measure and see the capacity of everything that's spiritual about you. Forget what your flesh is all about. See, your body is the outer part. Right. But watch this. Once again, I've told people all the time. I said many of us are caught up in our vanity mirror and we like to look at ourselves on the outside and dress ourselves up a certain way. But what the spirit is saying, what the messenger is saying, it ain't about you and your external or your, your physical. It's about what's going on in your spiritual. Because, see, you'll be trying to measure all day to measure up to what is righteousness with your external. Didn't Paul say the spirit wars with the flesh or wars with the human nature or wars with its body? So the thing is, uh, 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 John is getting a revelation here to not concern himself with what he looks like on the outside. That is not of importance. What's of importance is knowing the capacity of the inside. Because see, right now, your outside is already set. You think about it. When they built the temple in the Old Testament, they made the outer court of a certain dimension. Well, nothing could be changed about it. Once it was set, that's it. It, it was already in position and wasn't meant to be shifted or changed in 
any other way. The thing that experiences change is what goes on in the inner court. Y'all, y'all, y'all got to hear what, what, what really goes on in the tabernacle, what really goes on in the temple, what really goes on in the place where God dwells. See, that's what's impacted by change. By the walls of the, of the temple courtyard, everybody on the outside don't see what's going on on the inside. I hope somebody's hearing me and grabbing this. They don't see what happens on the inside because the walls prevent that. But this is what he's saying. Don't worry yourself with what's going on uh, to your external Concern yourself with what's going on to the internal. This is what's going on with John. And the scripture says, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. All right. It is given unto the Gentiles. Gentiles is in the Greek ethnos, which ethnos means heathen, foreign, or, or watch this real revelation. Those who are not in a relationship with God. Everybody that 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 was not uh, uh, committed to God or in covenant to God are what were called Gentiles. All right. So they would be considered heathen because they're not in a relationship of love with the true God. So by the scripture here, what, what's being implied is he's saying is that your external is is given to uh uh, uh, a place of being in no relationship with God. Your internal is what should be. Your spirit man should be in relationship with God, but your physical man or your external is not. And, and by the scripture, it says, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot. Because watch this, if you are the temples of God and within you is the spirit of God, then your spirit represents the city. It represents, watch this, the kingdom, uh, 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 the king in your dome. It represents uh, everything that God is about. So it says now the city is tread underfoot 40 and two months. All right. So watch this. When we talk about tread underfoot, it's talking about walking. When you look at walk in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, it means to tread down. So what happens is uh, uh, those out of relationship with God or don't have a relationship with God, those that you may call heathen, those who you may call foreigners to the body of Christ are the ones that keep walking on you. John is getting a revelation that don't worry about your external because the world is always going to beat you down. The world is always going to tread on you based on what you do in your outer, based on what you look like in your outer. So he's getting a revelation. We have to get a revelation of this as if we was John as well, that there are some things that are going to continue to tread on us. And see, if, if you understand this, if you understand anything about trading, let, let, let me go a little bit into that right there because if anything knows, if anybody knows anything about making preparation to a yard, what happens is people in the olden days, when they were prepping their yard to, to be fertilized or to be seeded in order to change the quality of the grass or so forth, what they would wear is shoes with spikes and they would walk up and down the yard. They, they would keep walking back and forth because it, it was breaking up and making fertile in order for change to occur. See, a lot of folks are, are, are walking around their life with slick bottom shoes. And when I say that, get a revelation here. Everybody could wear tennis shoes out in their front yard. But after you have walked across high grass in your front yard and you don't go uh, over and over again, what happens is the grass pops right back up and nobody knows you were ever there. So in this as John is, 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 is really being told about the city being tread underfoot, what happens is just as much as we are supposed to tread down the adversary, we got to understand there's, there's a balance of evil just as much as there's a balance of good. So in that, when I began to build on my city, 
I should not think it's strange like Peter said, these fiery darts. I should not think it's strange that there's going to be an adversary that's always wanting to walk me down, tread me down, step on me, cause me to have hurt, pain, frustration, uh, 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 exhaustion, destruction, all kinds of things going on. But watch this. Watch this. What he's really implying, though, is it's making you fertile. It's making you prepared to be seated. It's making you prepared in order to flourish. Okay, okay, okay. So he said, shall tread underfoot 40 and two months. Now, if anybody is a mathematician, they will begin to understand. If we were looking at that, uh, whether, whether we talk Julian counter uh, or, or any of the ancient counters, we, we're saying on an average, if there's 12 months in a year, give or take, then 40 and two months is three and a half years. OK, now we pay we, we that that should ring home with some people, because if you remember, Daniel in the Old Testament talked about the years of tribulation. And and he, he said there will be a seven year pact. Uh, three and a half years would be a utopia. But then the last three and a half years would be uh, like hell on earth. And we began to understand that from the New Testament as Jesus was talking in Matthew 24, the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And we began to understand this as we even get further and further into Revelation about some things that are being being made, some some covenants or some decrees that are being made that are going to be broken. And we understand that there's a thing about three and a half years uh, 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 that is going to be challenging to some. So understand this. If that be the case, could it be that even as to what the world would see in a seven year pact or covenant of a utopia, it's still going to be hard for those that are spiritual. Hear, hear what I'm saying. Get a real revelation. Even though we can look at that and dissect that from Daniel, we can dissect it from John, we can dissect it from all the other end time prophetic writings. The thing is, we, we begin to understand that in the reality of a thing, the world has to have what it expects to be a utopia. The world has to have what it expects to be a time of, of perfect joy, peace, or, or, or all of their needs being met in the natural. However, those who are spiritual beings in God, uh, I beg to differ. It's a little bit different on this end because if we're claiming that we don't picked up our cross to follow him, there ain't going to be nothing easy about this walk on this side of the stratosphere until we have become completely transformed individuals to live with Christ in eternity. There's got to be something even in what the world says is great. There's going to be a struggle. Y'all got to get it now. You think about it. Notice that even even now in the world, and I'm not saying necessarily that this is the three and a half years that's being referred to, but I'm giving you a revelation as to how to begin to perceive this in the spirit. Think about it. There's many believers in the body of Christ who are great women and men of God that have served God, that have been faithful to God, but notice that they're still in a place of struggle. Why is it that they're still in a place of struggle? But yet those who do wrong, who, who, who do things after the way of the world, notice that they're in a place of great wealth or they're in a place of great power, which means places of great influence. So we notice the difference even mildly dealing with natural things. And so it's the same thing here as we begin to understand this spiritually. Amen. Amen. So it says three and a half years, verse three, verse three, it says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Okay. It says, I will give, let's, let's look at verse three. Verse three says, I will give. All right. Now. When we talk about give, give is the Greek word didomai, which means to to hand to, to to give or allow to take possession of. So it says, I will give power. All right. Power here is exousia, which means the power of influence, the the power that's known as will. So I will give influential power. Uh, unto my two witnesses. 
Now, watch this. This is interesting. Uh, we talk about witness. Now, a lot of times people don't get into what a witness is. We look at it like uh, going to court and somebody says they either did something or they didn't do something. And then everybody looks to say, was there anybody that witnessed it? And, and somebody says, yeah. And we look at witness as to what Webster's Dictionary says as to somebody that saw and validates what somebody says. Amen. However, let me begin to expand your understanding on witness, especially when we talk about spiritual things. Notice here the word uh, witness comes from the Greek word martus, which not only means witness, but it means martyr. Oh, hold that thought right there. If somebody is a martyr, then that means somebody that died for the cause. I didn't make that up. That, that, that's what the word translates out to mean. All right. So it says, I will give willpower or the power of influence unto my two witnesses or martyrs. And they shall prophesy a uh, thousand and two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. All right. Now. Understand this. Let me let me uh, uh, deal with this here for a minute. It says, "They shall prophesy." Now, prophesy here is propheteo, which means to foretell events or do divine speaking or be under divine inspiration. All right. So what happens is, notice that it says a thousand two hundred and three score days. All right. So that's one thousand. 260 days. When we do the math for that, it's the equivalent of what's being said in verse two, three and a half years. So on, on one instance, it's, it's, it's month to month. Hear, hear what I'm saying. I'm giving you a revelation. Verse two talks about month to month. You being walked down by the Gentiles that almost sound like your monthly bills. It, it, it sounds funny, but could it be a revelation? Just like we pay bills by month, could it be that we influ are influenced by the pains and the struggles of things on a monthly basis? All right, because 42 months, months by culture, is talking about every new moon. So that's every 30 days. But it says the prophets or the two witnesses would prophesy for 1,260 days. And notice it says days, it wasn't talking months. So that means that there was a voice, regardless of what's happening by cycle, month by month, that everybody goes through in the system of the world, i.e. the matrix that we live in, the witnesses are operating by their daily bread. Didn't Jesus say in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread. So he said, give us this day our bread or our manna or our word that we need to live on a daily basis, not on a monthly basis. So now the witnesses have a divine word that's being spoke day in and day out regardless of the month. Can I still be a little more deep with y'all uh, before we close this thing out for tonight as well? Uh, I want to throw this to your attention because we have many theologies regarding who the two witnesses are. Amen. But I wanted to touch this. I wanted to touch this. We have many theologies regarding who the two witnesses are. All right. For, for most theologies, everybody is hovering around uh, two or three individuals that are known. Moses, Elijah, and Enoch. Why, why do they hover around those three? Other than the fact, for those that know by the Old Testament, Moses was one of the most significant prophets of the Old Testament. And if, as everybody knows, as he went up in the mountain, nobody knows what happened to his body. It's said that he died there uh, 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 and the people mourned for 40 days. But the thing is, uh, it is considered that he might be one of these witnesses that shall come back. In the same turn, Elijah. If you remember the story of Elijah and Elisha, as the scripture says that Elijah rode away on a chariot of fire and he dropped this mantle back to Elisha. So be it that 
uh, there's no reference or record of what happened to the body of Elijah. It is believed that Elijah could be one of these two. In the same term, people go back to uh, the book of Genesis and with Enoch. And the scripture says that he walked away with God. There's no record of what happened to his body or so forth. So now you can see in the theology that many people wore as to saying it's it's two of these three people that are probably uh, the witnesses. But as I began to 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 meditate on this and prepare for tonight, the Holy Spirit dropped something else in my spirit. And I'm not saying this is the gospel, but I, I want to challenge it and throw it into your spirit. That could it be that the two witnesses could also be uh, uh, Stephen and Peter? Now, I know y'all are listening to me saying, what, apostle? I ain't never heard that in my life. What do you mean, Stephen and Peter? Well, let, let me just throw a little revelation to you to consider the possibility. I'm not saying it is, but I'm giving it the possibility. Because bottom line is, regardless of who the two witnesses are, it makes no bearing on our salvation of living in eternity. Only thing is by the word that it's, it's validating that these were two that had died for the cause. Okay, now, keep in mind this, which is where I'm gonna lead you with Stephen and Peter. If you remember, Stephen was made a martyr and in his martyrdom of being stoned, Jesus was seen standing by the father. Okay, keep this in mind. Jesus had come Old Testament wise, the prophets that we think of Enoch and Elijah and Moses, we cannot validate that they had necessarily an encounter with Jesus. We know they had an encounter with God. If y'all know Old Testament wise, Jesus was veiled in the, in the entire Old Testament. He only manifests when he is born in the New Testament. So Stephen and Peter were after Jesus had physically come, physically died, and physically resurrected and went back to eternity. Stephen was martyred on behalf of Jesus. Scripture says my two witnesses. Now, in the same turn, technically you could say the same thing with Peter because of the record be told, Peter was crucified upside down on behalf of Jesus. So he was martyred for Jesus. All right, let's roll back then. The scripture says my two witnesses, meaning as we're on the inside of who Jesus is here, who Christ is, who the Yeshua is, these are two New Testament references of witnesses or martyrs who had given their life for Christ and the cause. Amen. Just wanted to throw that in your hearing in order to bless you just to consider that as the possibility since there's nothing right now that we got that validates what is the official identity of the two witnesses. Amen. Amen. Well, bless God then, and this will conclude the teaching for tonight.